Hello, everybody. When I started this project, we were in the early days of a very hot summer. Well, it is now October and the chilly winds have arrived. The leaves are turning golden and amber. The seasons are moving, the times are changing. However, we are continuing with the communal practices project, and there are many more conversations to come. At the end of this particular interview, I refer to a wonderful book by Jacques Derrida called The Politics of Friendship. I brought this book up because I wanted to end our discussion, and now I want to begin our discussion with the idea of friendship. I want to elevate friendship, as Derrida did, to the level of a philosophical concept or a principle of practice, or perhaps an idea that is essential for us to consider as we attempt to address the most urgent of climate and human rights issues that are pressing upon us this day. How will these questions change? How will our manner of addressing these questions change? if we place friendship at the center of our inquiries. So today I'm in conversation with a friend. His name is Arden Henley. Arden is known for a number of things. First of all, he and his wife, Mary Keane, pioneered family therapy in British Columbia. From the earliest times I knew Arden, he believed that coming to get people coming together are able to find new ways to continue on together. His work was always social, always communal, and never simply the private act of a private citizen. Secondly, Arden was instrumental in beginning the Master of Counseling program with City University in Canada a program that began and still has connections with City University of Seattle and was able to be transplanted north with Arden and his team. Arden, perhaps against the odds, was able to make this counseling program into something unique in the world of master's level counseling programs. And thirdly, Arden has recently been working with a team of environmentalists, educators, and community members to develop GTEC, that is, Green Technology Education Center. Arden and those he gathers together are finding ways to respond to the climate crisis that is set before all of us. always creating, always bringing people together. Arden Henley, to me, is a friend who I deeply admire. It is my joy and my privilege to introduce you today to Arden Henley. So Arden, I want to begin um, I told you the story about Lynn Hoffman and communal practices. And I'm wondering what that term might evoke for you. What it evokes for me is um, how I've been uh, describing my preoccupations of late, um, which is I've described my work as village making. Village making. And so, um, you know, I wrote a piece recently uh, that was entitled, What if a village started a university? Is that in that book you told me about? Uh, no, no, that's, uh, I, I can send you the, the brief piece, but. I would be um, very grateful. <laughs> you know, um, it's, a, it's a transformation of the term networking. Yes. It sounds yes. terribly abstract and clinical to me. Yeah to village, which has the messy connotation of actual human relationships. I love it. <laughs> I'll tell you a little story before we get into it. Um, 
uh, one of the people I'm going to be interviewing is interviewing is Maika. Oh, cool. And uh, because I want that, an African perspective on this. Yes. Right. Um, but I've always described Maika to Maika as the welcomer at the gates of the village called City University. Yes. And well, there you makes, go. Makes people feel welcome. So the, the metaphor resonates with me. Yeah. Well, hopefully she'll talk about Ubuntu. Oh, she will. <laughs> so tell me more about this vision for communal practices and, 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 and how you see it within the, the village metaphor. Well, um, part of it originates in my quest to understand how it is that we can be so aware of the imminent destruction of the world around us and yet collectively seem hesitant to act. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my part of my quest has been, you know, as an, as an educator, as a healer, what, what is that made up of? How does that happen? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I think our indigenous colleagues have been trying to tell us for a long time that uh, you're disconnected from one another as well as disconnected from the environment. Yes. Otherwise, you wouldn't find it possible to behave in the way that you do. Yes, indeed. And um, so uh, then, you know, uh, how does one respond uh, given that? What's ameliorative? What's healing? And so, um, you know, rebuilding relationships is a part of the work. In this case, um, centered on the theme of restoring, uh, regenerating the environment. You know, that's sort of the, the language of this particular village or yeah. the intention of this village. But, um, you know, it requires relationship building, inclusiveness, um, collective concept development, and so forth, all of which, you know, fit nicely to me within communal practice. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I should add that, um, you know, my dissertation and at SFU focused on a, what I call the communal theory of leadership. Really? And yeah. And so in this work, I framed leadership as a particular way of serving the community and, you know, a sort of convenience to the community to have leadership. Right. So that's beautiful. It's interesting you say that because one of Lynn Hoffman's passions she wanted, she felt that we needed another language, not, not the language of leadership, the language of something else. Yes. And before she died, she encountered, um, I, I introduced her to it, the, the work of uh, Suzanne Simard. You know, this was years ago, but she's really yep. well known now. But, um, um, and the concept of mother tree. Yes. Was, was one that she loved. So instead of leadership, you've got the mother tree that, that is passing on, you know? So anyway, it's interesting. So you've been exploring different ideas about leadership. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, you know and, and seeing the leader's responsibility as, first of all, to give voice to the highest intentions of the community. And by giving voice, then starting to focus energy, attention, and action on the materialization of the community's best intentions. Have you got some stories you can share with us about this kind of leadership? Well, for sure. Um, I mean, the way in which GTEC is evolving. Um, as you know, GTEC, just to help 
Green Technology Education Center. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the way it originated was a heartfelt sense among many people at City University that the role of a city university should go beyond simply credentialing people mm. um, or even equipping them with the appropriate micro credentials to um, perform uh, in the production of therapy. So if it's the case that a university has a larger role, what is that role? Was the dialogue mm. that started to take place. So here, you know, um, I'm giving expression to and in the initially incohate feelings and impulses around me to then move into a dialogue. Okay, so what the dialogue came up with is, you know, that universities should respond to the most pressing needs of the day. Right. Transforming its privilege. Right. I mean, who else has time to sit around and talk, um, read books, mm. um, talk to other younger people about it? You know, who else has that privilege? And so how it can be converted in, in service of the broader community. So responding to the pressing needs and contributing to the community were the two themes mm. that emerged from that dialogue. And then that in turn, then the next question in the sequence is, okay, if that's the case, what does, and this is the social architecture part, what does giving form to this look like? <laughs> and so the form giving was the outcome of the form giving was the Green Technology Education Center. Got it. So, you know, it it's and 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 it was initially envisioned within City University, you know, and for a, a number of reasons was a larger, some would say more grandiose vision than the university now in San Diego was interesting, interested in endorsing. So we spun it off and spun me off with it. One of the things that I find interesting is um, working with others on a vision that was pressing, uh, prescient and pressing. Um, the, had to happen, right? It, we're, we're, we're talking about how we can live together and, and be respectful and, and, and create space for all of the living and, yeah. uh, and all of the people. That, that didn't take root ultimately in the university setting or it did somewhat, but I mean, you had to find another outlet for it. And this to me is, is an interesting process because I, I think this happens a lot. Yes. Right? Um, can you talk a little bit about that process uh, a little bit? Well, you know, uh, let's take the example of, um, or very early example of the London School of Economics. Yeah. You know, it, it spun off from the University of London. Um, because uh, a number of faculty and colleagues outside the university who became later known as the Fabians okay. became increasingly convinced that a response to the ravages of industrialization was required from mm. intellectuals and artists. And so the London School of Economics was initially thought of as um, a center of learning that would be a part of that kind of socio-political response. Mm. Wonderful. Yeah. So that's the that's a spin-off example. That's a great example. 
and, and I didn't. So um, conversations happen that were kind of organized around City University and went beyond it and ended up becoming Green Technology Education Center. Correct. And so this happened because of the, the communal practices of people coming together with a vision and, and ideas that could happen. Tell us about the Green Technology Education Center and through all these dialogues, what it, it, what it has become, what is being created through these, uh, these ongoing conversations? Well, Chris, what's interesting is, you know, when you uh, take the periphery and move it somewhere else and start to materialize it, yeah. make it happen, yeah. there's, I think, very likely to be also an identity crisis mm. because you've subtracted a whole lot of the infrastructure, but also the taken for granted routines and conversations outside into space. Yes, yes. You know, so um, the same thing happened with the LSC as happened with GTEC. We then had to sort out, okay, well, what was it going to be or what is it going to be? And initially we, you know, we had a, a, a very architectural vision that took the form of a building, um, you know, which soon became apparent to us would cost yeah. gazillions of dollars in Vancouver. Yeah. You know, uh, like for the property alone. And yeah. so, we stepped back from that initial picture of an actual, albeit very different, education center to begin to think about, okay, how do we take the first faltering steps on the ground um, and have a presence? And so that led to some initial programming, the first of which was um, the Neighborhood Environmental Education Project. And the, the vision there was to bring the environmental learning that has been taking place in many uh, organizations and groups to the, directly to the community. Right. So. Um, how did you do that? We uh, partnered with 14 different uh, organizations all the way from hub cycling through the Environmental Youth Alliance to Ecojustice to present workshops in neighborhood houses. Nice. And we also did a Joanna Macy influence support group for the many people that we were finding were dis distressed. And we also held a groundbreaking town hall at Kitsilano Neighborhood House, where over 40 people from the community met with the ragtag group of environmentalists that assembled to have a dia an open dialogue. So, yeah, tell us more. So then along came COVID <laughs> and cut the action, you know? Yeah. So, um, the next thing we did, uh, we began to see that if and when this ever ends, what happens then? Is it an opportunity for the much needed socio and economic transformation of society? Mm. So we pulled together a core team surrounded by a circle of people with special knowledge in things like building retrofitting, organic farming, and so forth, and cooked up what became an influential report um, called Rebuilding BC, available on GTEC's website, which eventually resulted in meetings with um, George Heyman, uh, with the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change, 
Beck Beattie Ministers, uh, Dave Eby gave us a call. Um, and it, the report was also endorsed by a, a number of the luminaries in the field from David Suzuki through Joel Solomon to Seth Klein. Wow. So um, it was an impactful report, you know, which in the end, one could say in all honesty, was translated into the usual incremental change that government prefers, at least thus far, uh, rather than the transformative change which the report imagines. However, um, it put us on the map. Um, we also did a really fun thing. Um, we have developed an AI mediated application. Really? Um, and we um, used that application to deliver a program that we called Gen Z Goes Electric in, in partnership with two high schools, one in Vernon, one in Richmond. <laughs> so anyway. So, the, so I want to know more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so the, the goal was to elevate the awareness of young people for one of the solutions um, to the climate crisis, which is the electrification of transportation, um, particularly in light that senior high school students are just beginning to a drive or about to drive, so. Right, right. Yeah. That's fantastic. And the thing that was mind blowing about it, I have to say is that the as homework assignments were to create an Instagram post, to create a pitch for peers. But finally, the one that really got us is to create TikTok videos. Chris, oh, wow. these young people are so sophisticated. I mean, we have on our website in a blog post about this project, a 15, se 15 second video that will blow your mind created by a 15 year old, it would take me days to figure out if I ever could what he did, probably with his smartphone. That's fantastic. Yeah. I'm so glad you're turning to, um, to that age. Yes. You know, in my career now, I've returned back to those of the that's the age I'm, I'm working with him as a counselor. And um, just an aside, but I think it will fit. So I put this out there. Um, so I live in Penticton now, and I'm seeing these young people. And almost every young person comes in with psychiatric language. And that yeah. language is uh, two things, anxiety and depression. And and they feel that's inside them. Right? Uh -huh. And uh, I have it. I have anxiety. I have depression. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and they, almost all of them come with this. And I ask everyone pretty much. Um, I ask them if they feel connected to the lake and to the rivers and to the, the trees. Uh -huh. and, the mountains. and they all say yes. And they tell me stories about being connected. And I'll ask them, well, this anxiety that you talk about, is it also connected to the rivers and the lakes and the mountains and the trees and the animals? Yeah, well, can you tell me more about that? And so they start talking about that and that which is, was considered a mental health issue becomes part of the larger world and it becomes part of the world around them. And, yes. um, and these are the dialogues I'm having every day, you know. Um, so I was very interested because I think there's a big parallel to what you're talking about, especially when you went to the high schools there. And you get all these TikTok things going. Um, and so much of the conversations I'm doing are, you know, tell me why that river is important to you. You know, um, tell me why where do you go and where you find this peace with nature? Tell me about it. 
like you make it visible for them. And they do. And it's just, I just feel like I'm so privileged to have those conversations with people. Marvelous. And it feels, anyway, that's what I thought of as I'm listening to you, as you're working with all of these people in finding new ways to talk about our walk on this earth. And uh, yes. yeah. Wow, that's brilliant. I'm gonna steal it. <laughs> Yeah. you don't mind <laughs> I'm on. We're, we're in some dialogue with uh, a major Canadian Canada-wide youth organization about helping them develop peer support groups because the activists the kids on the front line are really suffering yes they are and there's a whole bunch of them that are not necessarily as active that are suffering as well yes and for the, um, or they may not look as active. I think yeah. they often are, you know. Yes. And they do it in their own ways. And yeah. uh, um, it's been so encouraging for me to see that. Yes. I saw a cartoon today. And the cartoon was a bunch of tree stumps. And uh, there were two people and there was a koala bear. And the koala bear was trying to climb up the tree and it was just a tree stump. And one person says to the other person, that koala bear has a mental health problem. <laughs> so with that in mind, talk to me about, because you, you know, you helped develop the counseling program. Talk to me about mental health or whatever we want language we want to use. My friend Lynn did not like that term. Um, and, and the sea and the rivers and the birds and the crows and the coyotes. And can, do you have something you can talk to us about? In that thing? Well, sure. I mean, I think um, our disconnection from the seas, the rivers, the mountains, in the way that we lead our lives every day is part of what prevents us from addressing the destruction of those environs yes. more directly. Yes. So um, I think in an urban setting, uh, one of the ways that that's starting to be adjusted is through urban farming, urban agriculture, urban forest. Right. And I have experienced this in my own life um, over the last four spring and summers, having converted the front lawn of our house into raised beds. Well, you I saw. Have, I've witnessed that. You witnessed it. And so uh, initially, I mean, I was doing a pretty lousy job. Um, and I'm not, I don't have a particularly green thumb, but I, I kept being taught by the soil, the and, 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 and one of the interesting things is, as I learned the world around me began to respond, like the more I planted flowers, the more bees showed up. Um, the more flowers blossomed, the more, well, and not only flowers, but herbs. You know, some of the herbs do some beautiful blossoming like lavender. Well, along came hummingbirds. I have experienced your lavender. Yeah, good. And then in that very backyard where you sat filming Mary, I'm sitting talking to a colleague and a squirrel marches up and joins the conversation. Yeah, very beautiful. Yeah. You know, so what I learned wa was in a felt way, a whole lot about the sacredness of the natural world. Yes. 
you know, which is sounds airy fairy, but it's actually very much to do with your hands in the dirt and what feels like that, what that feels like. And with what Gary Snyder says, if you want to do something revolutionary, stay put. Yes. What a great so, thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, You're the third person in these interviews to evoke Gary Snyder. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, he's been on this journey for a very long time and yeah. obviously in the very prescient and evocative way that poets are. Thank you for um, bringing this world into the city in our conversation. I, I'll tell you why I think that's so important, particularly for Vancouver. Yes. Because Vancouver, you've got the sea and you've got the mountains and, and you can see them. And so nature's over there, right? And, and we go and play in it, and, um, but it's over there. Yeah. And um, I'll, I'll never forget one time, right near City University, there was a homeless man, I'm presuming he was homeless, sitting on a bench and his arms were out like this. On one arm was a crow. On the other arm was a pigeon. And yep. I was thinking, this man understands um, the livingness of the city more than most of us do. For sure. Yeah. I just thought that was a wonderful sight. I can picture it. I can picture the bench. bench. You probably know the bench, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because City U is right on that border, right? Um, between the, the, between the um, high money and those, yes. that really, those that are really suffering. Yeah. Yeah. If it's possible, I'd like to explore some more um, mental health counseling side of this and, sure. and its connection to... I'm, I'm trying not to use the word nature because that implies again, there's a division, there's two worlds, but to that living world that we encounter. I was wondering if you have any more insights on that that you might wanna share. Um, let me share some uh, research that I encountered yesterday, thanks to uh, an activist physician on our board who works with young people. Wonderful. And um, this is a huge research project that was done in Europe that establishes a direct connection between climate anxiety and government inaction about the climate. Mm. So, but I think that, you know, the major point that has been our life work is to recontextualize human suffering hmm. you know to help uh, keep reminding ourselves and the people we work with and we people we serve that um it's not necessarily the case that it's something wrong with their hardware right that's um resulting in the pain that they're experiencing um, thank you for that. I think that's a much needed message in this day and age, because so many of the, the young people I'm interacting with believe there is something wrong with their hardware. They've been told that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just like that koala bear was being told that you know sure well it's a, a deeply embedded presumption yeah yeah but what i want to add to that is the work of the daughter of a friend of mine named carolyn pedwell and her point is that it's not only the ideas and the discourse in which these 
assumptions are now embedded. It's in the very routines of society. Thank you. Tell us more. That, you know, what have become our patterned ways of interacting reinforce ideas like the internalization of suffering. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so as soon as the young person is evidencing um, some form of unnormative behavior, for example, then they find themselves in an encounter with medical people yeah. who are earnest, trying to help, but their embedded frame of reference is their situation, their routines and patterns are medical. Yeah. So what are you to assume if that's what you uh, encounter? And those of us that are part of the mental health industry, we have those similar patterns of behavior. Sure. Uh, and, and even to the most basic one of all, I mean, uh, as far as counselors go, you know, if someone's suffering, you make a phone call, make an appointment and go see this, what I call one of the new priests. Yeah. Well, and, it's looks, or it looks like a talking doctor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's how you deal with suffering now. And so that's embedded, as you're saying, that's embedded not only in the discourse and the ideas, it's embedded in the practices. That's right. Yeah. And then in the, and, and, and routines to me has become an important concept because those are unquestioned, reflexive, architecturally structured patterns of behavior. So I tell you what that evokes for me. Sure. You know, I worked for over 30 years with the Stahela's First Nation. Yes. And um, I remember when I started working there that um, some of the white teachers and other people there were quite concerned that the, um, the children uh, weren't looking them in the eye right and and yeah. were concerned about that kind of a, a, a thing and they, they felt it was disrespectful and the like and i started to instead i started to do things that didn't require looking in the eye yes and so i would go for drives and walks yeah and we would sit and draw pictures sometimes as well and 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 um but so much of the time we were, we spent moving through their land mm -hmm. and seeing the eagles and the salmon and the bears and the ravens. And uh, um, sometimes we would stop in and visit with Rocky LaRock, this wonderful uh, uh, carver, um, an artist from there. And there was this moving together which became the routine that they did with me. And sometimes I felt that was being a bit challenged by some of the people in the school. Um, sure. uh, some of the white people there in particular, it wasn't what counselors usually do. But, but I felt that we needed different habits. <laughs> yes. And, and one of them was, Let's get out there and find ways to move through their land. And, um, um, and I'm not doing that now, though I'm finding other ways to do it. Well, perhaps it's possible to do that imaginatively as well as concretely, for it example. Is. Well, um, one of the habits I, I do now is, is painting. And... Um, um, to me, it's really important because it's not just encountering nature, it's creating with nature. Yeah. And that to me is one of my new habits. I know, and it's very, you're, I, I treasure what you post on Facebook. Well, thank you. It's really, you know, you're, you're very, it's a gift that you've received. Well, and it's, it's something that I find great comfort in. I, I, I'm dealing with an illness, as you know, 
Yes. And when I paint, I don't get tired. When I do my work, which is talking to people, I get very tired very quickly. But when I'm painting, or also the same with my music making, I, 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 it's something I can do that doesn't wear me out. And so it's had this new kind of function for me. Um, so that's all fitting into me to the, the whole idea of, of new routines. Absolutely. And from a Qigong point of view, right now, more painting, more music, <laughs> less talking. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, there we go. Yeah. I still do like talking. I still like doing this. And, and, yes. And the like. Um, but I, 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 I can't do it as much as I would like to have. Um, we've covered a lot of ground already, and I'm, I'm wondering what more there is that we need to talk about. Uh, I think that um, one of the things we're going to be working on, and I would like to say, is that we need to provide a vision of a new world. Hmm. Um, because the discourse of science and technology about climate, as relevant it is as it is to our situation, yep. does not, what it suggests is deprivation. Yes. Yeah. You can't do this anymore. Um, and I think we have to describe the world that we can do. Oh, thank you. Tell me more. Tell me more. Well, you know, uh, we can turn the roads into gardens and cities. <laughs> um, you know, we can collectivize transportation on a whole lot of levels, yep. not just the SkyTrain, but, you know, autonomous vehicle corridors mm -hmm. can connect neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. We can um, localize artistic creation much more. So, you know, you go to the local community center and, you know, you encounter painting, poetry, music, you know, as well as the workout room. Um, so, but, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a much more neighborly community environment. Uh, one, where there's much more uh, electrical and food security manifesting on a local level. So we need, as the elders, to present this picture um, of the world. And then we need also to, there are pathways, Chris. There's some beautiful work done by Paul Hawken, by Mark Jacobson, you know, that are very definitive, uh, valid from a science and engineering point of view to a different future, but they're presented in a manual-like way right, right. of writing that the great majority of us will fall asleep by page three. Right. So part of our work is not only to present the new imagined future, but to translate these pathways into much more accessible language and discourse. And to, which I think you're, which you're doing, to bring those that matter into the conversation of what this future is going to look like. Yes. Right. So, and you're doing that with the TikTok. Yeah. Yes, I have a lot to learn about social media, my friend. Well, yeah, when we get older, there's so many, so much of it I think we can do. But, uh, um, but I'm glad that they are. Yeah. And, uh, um, and they're finding their paths, you know. We have to understand the murmur much more. The murmur. The murmur, you know. Um, Tell me more. Because... You know, and that, that's how I'm describing social 
I mean, social media, young people, but not even, not so young people. You can see the extent to which we're all plugged into the murmur. Hmm. We can hardly go a minute without picking up our device to make sure that, you know, we have seen the latest Instagram post or whatever. So I think we need a better understanding of the murmur. Hmm. I'm really thinking about that. I, I think there's something there. I yeah. like the language of it too. I just made it up. So this is ours. <laughs> the murmur. Well, because it implies that it's everywhere. Yes. It, it implies that that's what's trying to break forth in these conversations I'm having with young people. It's the, uh, there's a murmur that's kind of yeah. trying to break forth. It implies uh, how we need to do politics. We need to listen to the murmur. We need to make room for this murmur, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, it implies how we need to do education, right? We, we need to not top down. We need a space where the murmur can come to life and can be seen in its context. Uh, on the ground and in the mountains and in the cities and, and the like. Yep. I love it. I recently uh, gave a workshop called Aging into Uncertainty at a senior center. Yep. And, and I provided some contexts in which the murmur could become explicit. It resulted in Remember this old term, communitas? Yes, yes. I witnessed that as people for the first time who belong to a community in common began to actually explicitly talk to each other about something that's important to them. Oh, that's fantastic. So to, when you said you witnessed it, can you uh, expand well, on that? Oh, yeah, sure. Like, you know, um, I first asked them to do exercises in groups of three where they worked by themselves and then not shared, not did the exercise together, but shared the experience of the exercise. Hmm. And then that enabled me to ask them to do the work together. And here is an example. Um, name six people who have had... Um, an enduring and constructive influence on how your life has unfolded. Um, what is the nature of this influence? And what does it tell you about yourselves, or yourself that this person chose to influence you in this way? This is a wonderful conversation. Oh, yeah. And then I turned it into the present, you know, name three people that, you know, anyway, you can imagine. No, no, no. Keep, oh, I don't want it to stop. I love this. Keep going. Okay. Well, name three people yeah. um, with whom, uh, oh, three. Oh, I called, um, I created this idea called companions of the, on the way. <laughs> companions of the way. It's sort of like Michael White's club of life. Yeah. So name three uh, companions of the way um, and identify how you could go about further developing your relationship with these companions of the way. Like this that. is lovely. One of the things I, um, I, I don't know if the people realize this, but you uh, and Mary, in my mind, pioneered family therapy in the lower mainland of this province and and in those beginnings you gave it a hope and a life and a buzz and a murmur um, that uh, was was um, life enhancing from the very very beginning and what I love about this conversation is you know, the innovation that you work from back then 
you haven't changed, you're still doing it. Uh, this, this, what, this workshop is just reminds me of what things you've done before. What's to stop for? <laughs> oh, well, I hope not. I hope nothing. It's, um, but it's encouraging for me to be able to see this over time. Uh huh. You know, and knowing you, you know, there's been some hardships and there's been some exclusions on the way that oh, have happened. Yep. yep. Uh, but you're, you're still, you're still giving, you, 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 you're still enchanted and you're still finding words and languages and listening for the murmur. That is how I'm going to think of you from now on. <laughs> well, we could add that to a concept that you introduced me to via Deleuze, which I find very helpful in that in village making, and that's the idea of the rhizome. Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, I, I have never tired of that. Yeah, well, and I've learned so much from bamboo about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's in your garden. Yes, <laughs> yes. I'm being rhizomed all the time. I, I added to one of the things that I, I talked about in a little piece I did individually on here is that there, you know, there are these two foresters that have had an influence. And one of them was Suzanne Simard, who really yeah. gives us a new vision for the rhizome. But there's another one, uh, uh, Beresford Kroger, Krager, I don't know how to pronounce her name. Uh -huh. And she's in Ontario and she, she, understands the trees and the plants and, and she gives you an image of the, the northern forest, of the boreal forest, as if it is constantly breathing life-giving chemicals into, into the world. And um, so the rhizome's a, a beautiful imagery, but I love that more uh, adding to it, the infusion of, of, of chemicals that the yes. plants and the trees do that nurture the whole planet. Yeah. Right. And there's something I think I, I, I love adding that to our mix of metaphors. Um, absolutely. Um, by the way, um, in the next issue of the reader, which Mary is now mm -hmm. editing, fortunately for all of us, um, um, there's a book review of uh, Susan Samard's book. Wonderful. Yeah. Is, did Mary write it? No. Um, her uh, niece, who's a student of hers, wrote it. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. From North Carolina. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. By the way, because um, of your connection to Mary, I want to say this. Um, she gave us a poet's voice. Yes, that's right. And I am so grateful. I am too. Because it's a, it's a voice we, we hear, but as you pointed out, we hear of the scientists and the technicians and, you know, yep. sometimes we fall asleep with them. But, um, um, but Mary gave us a poet's voice and it was located in her yard or in the front of the house and yeah um it was right where we were and um and she read it in her voice it wasn't like we got to read it quietly to ourselves no it came with her voice and all of that was such a to me a beautiful package it was in that exposition she did about um the nature of latinate language I know. was like oh man i mean we're all trying to understand colonialism there it is right there well the yeah it was it was news to me and it was um it, you know i i realized that okay let's find ways to lessen our dependence on those latin words yes and find other ways and um um and not I, not that we're going to do away with them but but to find other language that yeah places us from or makes us come from a different place i know yeah it's really anyway that was such a was a great interview that you both did i was so impressed and blown away and delighted. well i was thrilled and i, I want her to know that 
you know, uh, I know I said that, but I wanted to hear it again. I will pass that on to her. Yeah. I will pass it on to her. And I'll make sure it's on here so she hears it twice. <laughs> Good. Good. All right. All Is right. Any, anything else you want to add? Um, actually, I think that's probably a good place. And I, you know, we want to respect your generosity in doing this and uh, your need to take care of yourself. So I'm, I'm okay with concluding here. <laughs> you know, I think we need to conclude by celebrating the generosity of these conversations and yes. how the conversations themselves express what I take, Lynn, to mean by communal work. Yes. And I want to add another part, too, and it comes from Jacques Derrida. And <clears throat> it comes, you know, he wrote a lot of books that are a collection of essays. <clears throat> but there's one big, big book he wrote called The Politics of Friendship. And it's a very rich read. But also, what a wonderful concept to explore. And, and it's meant a lot to me because um, it's through the friendships that we were able to, we were able to do this because of a friendship. That's right. And, um, and I just think it's a concept that we need to cherish more. I could not agree more. <laughs>